The state-run canteen is open for business. Let's try how the food tastes in a state-run canteen. On October 31, 2022, China's Ministry of Housing and Construction and Ministry of Civil Affairs issued a joint notice requesting each city and region to select three to five communities to start a pilot project of building a complete community. The plan is to implement the idea nationwide in two years' time. It's to construct large packages of essential services, including communal canteens. Previously, we reported that the Chinese government has been expanding supply and distribution cooperatives throughout the country. These are all signs that the Planned Economy version 2.0 is starting up in China after the 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party ended. Let's look at communal canteens first. According to the announcement, the relevant ministries will select a number of models of complete communities and propagate them nationwide. The provincial levels housing and construction and civil affairs departments will organize three to five communities in each city or region to pilot the complete community construction. A complete community has a population between 5,000 to 12,000 people and provides comprehensive public services and management, including kindergartens, child care centers, senior service centers, community health services, convenience stores, grocery stores, canteens, etc., providing residents with one-stop services. Building a communal canteen has attracted the most public attention among all the items. On the Chinese social media platform Weibo, netizens are having heated discussions about the need to build communal canteens in neighborhoods. Many netizens have left comments. For example, some said, It's crazy, something is coming back. Whoever cooks at home in the future will have their doors busted and pots and pans smashed. I'm afraid they're going to lock you up in the neighborhood and not allow you to buy groceries so you can use the canteen voluntarily. Since the beginning of 2022, communal canteens have been operating on a pilot basis in various parts of China, such as Shanghai, Xi'an, and Shenyang, where a number of neighborhoods have been testing it out. The concept was created after the 20th Communist Party Congress in mid-October and eventually started to roll out on a large scale. In conjunction with the government document, the Chinese official media has started to publicize the communal canteens. It included running stories with titles like 5,000 state-run canteens are to be built in Hebei province. When netizens reacted negatively to the communal canteens, the official media then made various so-called clarifications and dispelled rumors. For example, the media claimed that the communal canteens were mainly for the convenience of the elderly in the community. And for the online story that's widely shared, titled 5,000 state-run canteens to be built in Hebei province, the media claimed that the government bulletin didn't contain clear requirements on who were to operate the canteens. The media explained that all kinds of catering institutions, school canteens, workplace canteens, etc. were included. We checked the government bulletin from Hebei province in June this year on the launch of nutrition and health restaurants or communal canteens. Indeed, there was no clear requirements as to who is to operate the canteens. However, there is no mention of which types of catering establishments can operate community restaurants either. The bulletin reads, The province has a target of no less than 5,000 canteens by 2025. Municipal governments and relevant departments should develop work plans and implementation programs around reasonable diets and reduction of salt, sugar and oil, clarify the organization and staffing of the construction of nutritious and healthy restaurants, and establish systems for raw material procurement, nutritional and health management, salt, oil and sugar procurement, ledgers and systems for preventing and restraining food waste. Food service operators and individual unit canteens are encouraged to establish a registration system for the use of salt, oil and sugar, including various condiments containing salt, oil and sugar, regularly record the number of people attending each meal and monitor the per capita intake. That is to say, the Chinese Communist government will pay close attention to the dining issue of Chinese people. Behind these meticulous statistics, the CCP is likely to try to figure out how much food, including salt, oil and sugar, etc., per capita is needed to sustain the basic survival of a nation. 
From the central to the local government circulars, it is unclear who will run these communal canteens and other essential services, and whether they will be run entirely by the state. We suspect that the CCP has chosen to avoid it during the initial stage because this is such a sensitive matter. It's to both test the waters and to give the public a chance to gradually accept the reality of state-run canteens. Chinese media coverage of communal canteens has been mainly positive, arguing from the perspective of them being cheaper in price and more generous in quantity. For example, this state-run canteen in Yunnan, a southwestern province, opens its doors, offering a combo of three meat dishes plus two vegetable dishes for 19 RMB, or two dollars and sixty U.S. with free fruit. It's a pity Chinese people don't buy it, as someone wrote. Only a fool would say that this product of planned economy is good. Use the power to screw up private enterprises in large numbers. In time, the peasants will be exploited dry by them. The market will lose its vitality. There will be fewer jobs. The consumer power will be destroyed, and the whole incentive to produce will be gone. Why then do state-run canteens disgust the Chinese people so much? Because in the 1950s and 60s, the public canteen was born in China, along with the Great Leap Forward and the People's Commune movement. It had the characteristics of one shared big pot of rice, giving it an egalitarian connotation, meaning everyone has equal access to food, and embodying people's illusion of communism. Mao Zedong, the first party leader at the time, regarded public canteens as the most important issue of the Great Leap Forward and the People's Commune. At a meeting, he made it clear that public canteens, where meals are free of charge, are communism. It showed that the Communist Party at the time wanted not only to implement a system of full and unrestricted public ownership in order to control the political and economic life of the entire society, but also to impose a communal lifestyle. Forcing its way into the private sphere and controlling the decisions of individual life, the result of free meals was disastrous. It was followed by a great famine that resulted in massive death. Thus, state-run canteens are associated with ideas like communism, a planned economy, and famine. The truth is, the genes that run in the blood of the CCP remain the same, no matter how many years have passed. On October 27th, just after the 20th Communist Party Congress, CCP leader Xi Jinping led the new Politburo Standing Committee and visited the Red Holy Land of Yan'an. The firm and correct political direction was the essence of the Yan'an spirit. In 1938, when replying to the question, "What should be learned at the military and political university of resistance against Japanese aggression in Yan'an?" Comrade Mao Zedong pointed out, "First and foremost, we need to learn about a political direction. All party members must adhere to the correct political direction, resolutely implement the party's basic theory, line, and policy, and thoroughly implement the party central committee's decisions and plans, so as to further advance the great cause pioneered by revolutionaries of the older generation." Why is the Chinese Communist regime so keen to emulate the practices of Mao Zedong's era now? The root of this regressive and erratic behavior in Beijing can be understood if we recognize the context in which the CCP is in. That is, preparing for war and drought, addressing a soon-to-be collapsed economy, specifically preparing for war against Taiwan and confrontation with the U.S. The CCP needs to mobilize military and civilian supplies to effectively prepare for war as it gets close to going to war on Taiwan. As we've reported a week ago, the long-vanished supply and distribution co-ops have also begun to resurface in China. The supply and distribution agencies, China Supply and Distribution Co-ops, the convenience service centers, Dongba has already started it. Beijing has already opened them. The supply and distribution agencies that unify the purchase and sale of goods. In the 20th Congress of the CCP, which just ended in October 2022, Liang Huiling, the director of the All China Federation of Supply and Distribution Societies, was promoted to the Central Committee. It indicates the political status of the supply and distribution societies has rocketed. The General Supply and Distribution Society has now become a ministerial-level unit under the State Council of China. Although the former director didn't have the same political status as a member of the Central Committee. 
Accordingly, news of the growing development of supply and distribution agencies has been featured in the Chinese media, such as the story of Hebei Province has expanded the rural supply and distribution system fivefold in five years. In Ningxia City in northwest China, the coverage rate of rural level supply and distribution cooperatives reached 92.7%. In Chongqing City in the southwest, the number increased to over 6,000, with a coverage rate of 76 percent. To date, China has close to 3,000 county-level supply and distribution co-ops and nearly 40,000 grassroots ones, with a coverage rate of nearly 100 percent at the township level. In mainland China's depressed A-share stock market, guess what sector is the hottest recently? It isn't the technology sector, nor the military, the real estate, or financial sectors. It's the concept stocks of supply and distribution cooperatives. A list of such stocks and other similar ones have surged in their price. This is in Hebei Province, Hebei Supply and Distribution Cooperative. They can set up a stall out on the curb. If it were other private entities, their stuff would have been confiscated. But the Supply and Distribution Cooperative, feel free to have a stall outside. This is Herping Li, the Supply and Distribution Co-op is bull. They can set up stalls outside at will. But other stores, if they try to sell vegetables at their own storefront, their stuff would have been confiscated long ago, because the front of the stores is supposed to be cleaned up. This is the advantage of the supply and distribution cooperative. They can beat the supermarkets without any problem. <laughs> in official Chinese documents, supply and distribution co-ops are described as cooperative economic organizations of farmers, and their English name is also co-op, a common form of farmer cooperation in Europe and the US. However, peasants in China don't have their own land, and their lives are controlled by the government. State-run canteens and supply and distribution cooperatives were once a standard part of China's deeply planned economy from the 1950s to the 1970s. In conjunction with these two were stamps of all sorts such as food, oil, meat, cloth, etc. The public relied on government-issued stamps to purchase the necessities of life through the co-ops. At that time, the co-ops monopolized almost all market distribution channels through government resources. Ordinary people had to go through them to buy and sell goods. The products produced by rural or home-based workshops had to be sold to the designated co-ops, or else they could be charged with the crime of opportunistic peddling. Later, as the reform and opening up started to happen, transportation became more convenient, supplies more abundant, and a large national market started to form with the rise of various individual and private stores, sending the supply and distribution cooperative system slowly into history. As foreign capital started to enter China, the supermarkets rose, and so did online e-commerce. The supply and distribution co-ops, once all over China, were gradually eliminated by the market and consumers under the competition of new consumption methods and consumer culture. Until 2014, a pilot comprehensive reform of supply and distribution cooperatives was included in the CCP's 2014 work highlights, and was once again included in the central government's number one document and work report. The All-China Federation of Supply and Sales Cooperatives recently issued a recruitment notice, stating that in 2023 it will recruit nationwide hundreds of thousands of clerks with bachelor's degrees and even graduate students as its employees with the status of public servants. The recent revival of communal canteens and supply and distribution cooperatives suggests that the Communist Party's return to a highly government-controlled economic model has been rolled out on a large scale after a long period of planning. We draw on the views of a China expert living in the U.S. to provide a more specific analysis. Today's supply and distribution cooperatives and large communal canteens are mutually supportive and organically integrated. It can be presumed that once they are fully rolled out, one of them will be in the rural areas, covering China's countryside and peasants. The other will be in the cities, controlling the rice bowls of urban residents. The supply and distribution cooperatives will monopolize the purchase and sale of grain, vegetables and fruits, and the food, oil, fruits and vegetables they provide will become the basis for cost control in the state-run canteens, which will also be the largest customers of the co-ops in the cities and towns. The supply and distribution co-ops and the public canteens located upstream and downstream in the food chain will both come under the jurisdiction of the government and slowly control all the sources of goods and upstream agricultural products. 
As a result, they will be able to control the market and prices. It is likely that under the Communist Party's planning, peasants will be obliged to sell their produce to the government, i.e. the supply and distribution co-ops and private restaurants and snack bars in the cities will end up facing price increases or supply cuts. City residents will find themselves with no choice but to eat in the canteens. Without customers in the city's restaurant industry, peasants will now have no choice but to sell to the government. Because they control the market, the supply and distribution cooperative, as the major player in the industrial chain, can force peasants to grow what they want, how to grow it, and sell at a price they set. In early April, China announced the decision of the State Council of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party on deepening comprehensive reform of supply and sales cooperatives. It reveals that supply and sales co-ops will offer a variety of services including farm machinery operations, agricultural supplies, formula fertilization, and storage and processing in a variety of ways, such as trusteeship of a large parcel of land, tilling and planting on behalf of others, shareholding cooperation, and sales-based production. This document has already planned a prototype for peasants to follow the government's instructions for production. The result is that the supply and distribution co-ops will monopolize the upstream of the food chain and the large communal canteens will monopolize the downstream, allowing the CCP to take over the entire business of Chinese people's food and drink. If the complete community created by the CCP, the basic services and facilities for the daily life of the people is replaced by the state, then the Chinese people will live in a surveillance system created by high technology. The launch of supply and distribution co-ops and large communal canteens will likely be followed by the implementation of a digital currency and other forms of digital controls. Instead of regulating the market with various stamps such as food and other necessities, the government could use digital forms, digital currency, digital wages, and electronic wallets, supplemented by new methods such as health codes, social credit codes, and surveillance cameras, to achieve comprehensive monitoring and control of the people and all aspects of their life, ranging from clothing, food, housing, and transportation, to birth, marriage, and death. In fact, this pattern has already emerged during the three years of epidemic control. Look, here are villagers relaxing and chatting in front of their homes. They fled in a hurry upon hearing the sound of such a vehicle. Yes, the police vehicle came to patrol. This practice by the authorities should be a way used to cope with the collapse of the Chinese economy that's happening right now. After the economic collapse, in the event of a food supply crisis or any other crisis, the CCP can use the supply and distribution co-ops and large canteens and revert to the original rationing system. The CCP has clearly realized that their international environment has completely changed. U.S. blockades and restrictions, technology bans, and diplomatic pressure on the CCP are increasing by the day. The CCP's close allies are confined to Russia, Iran, North Korea, etc. All these regimes are at war or in danger of war. China's economy is in trouble, the real estate market is depressed, and the unemployment and other problems brought by the zero-COVID policy are numerous. This is when I first came to Yiwu. I worked here before. Weihai Group. I worked here for almost four years. Today, I came to visit but it closed down. I thought I could still see my former colleagues. Now you see, no one is looking after it. It's all overgrown. In the past, it was a well-known private enterprise, and at its peak, thousands of people were working here. But now, it's like a ghost town. No one is there. This used to be where the securities were at the front entrance. It's so run down now. Such a large company has gone out of business just like this. 
The situation in factories this year is even worse than last year. Orders are fewer and fewer. Maybe it's really wintry now for workers. Maybe some friends think there would be a shortage of workers in factories. Why can't I find a job then? The reality is really not like what you think. Last year, despite the epidemic's influence, many factories could offer 30 RMB an hour at this time. But this year, many factories don't need people because there are no orders. This year, some factories had planned to hire 200 people, but ended up hiring only 80. 460,000 factories have closed down, and many electronics factories have not received large orders from Apple this year, leading to a sharp drop in demand in the entire market. Those who want to resign should think carefully. Some companies are already laying off employees conversely, like my cousin's company. She was replaced when she got back, and the work worsened. She does miscellaneous chores, and the salary is lowered as well, forcing you to quit voluntarily. In this particular time, don't quit a job easily. The slipping economy, the social unrest, the military advances, and the pending consolidation of power have all determined that today's CCP government is particularly in need of a highly controlled paramilitary management method that can keep the population's consumption and standard of living to a minimum while meeting the demand for its military to wage war. Since two years ago, the CCP has been hoarding grain across the board. China snatched up half of the world's grain reserves in previous years. The past two years have also seen a rather peculiar widespread shortage of electricity in China. One possibility is that the CCP is ramping up the production of weaponry, including nuclear weapons, in the third tier places, thus consuming a lot of electricity. Now that the CCP is facing new international sanctions, a siege by the US, Japan, India and Australia in NATO and Asia, and pressure to solve the Taiwan issue, it has increased its pace of hoarding everything from food and energy to chips and intensifying its war preparations. And all this coincides with the return of the supply and distribution co-ops and the large communal canteens. They go hand in hand. Although most Chinese netizens have expressed concern about the communal canteens, it's likely that they haven't yet realized the seriousness of the CCP's subsequent actions and intended plan. It appears the CCP's plan is proceeding well for the time being. But is it going to go well all the way, or is it possible for black swan events to happen in China and abroad? A black swan event is something that brings catastrophic results like the collapse of a currency or a huge stock value loss. So the situation in China won't necessarily unfold according to the CCP script. What will happen in China remains to be seen.